Daniela Ortiz dos Santos is an assistant professor at the Art History Department of the Gotha Institute of Frankfurt and a scientific coordinator of the Center of Critical Studies in Architecture, a research cluster between uh, the DAM, uh, the museum, the Technical University of Darmstadt and the Goethe University. She's author of the dissertation Roots of Modernity uh, or the Americas of Le Corbusier and co-curator the, the exhibition Moving Construction that uh, constructions that you have been able to see and I'm not only talking to the uh, uh, Portuguese audience but also to the international one. I've seen, I see some people here that have been in the Centre uh, Cultural of Belém uh, in Lisbon last year uh, where she um, co-curated uh, an exhibition which was called Moving Constructions. Uh, she's also a co-editor of the Proceedings of the Bauhaus Lecture Series that I am sure that after the virus it can be uh, outside. <laughs> so the conference will last approximately one hour and it is going to be followed by half an hour of discussion. Anyone who wants to participate in the debate and have the opportunity to ask questions directly to Daniel Ortiz dos Santos should please put a synthesis of the question in the messenger of the Zoom platform during the conference so that I can moderate them uh, better afterwards. You can ask your questions in English or even in Portuguese, Spanish, French and German once we have a polyglot with us today. And if some difficulty of under, and understanding arises, I will surely be able to help. Uh, it remains for me to thank Daniela Ortiz dos Santos for her generosity of accepting this challenge of virtually coming to Lisbon to give us this conference without being able to offer her the experience of touring her around our beautiful city, even if she knows it quite uh, a lot, since even though she has never lived here, She's also Portuguese, as Portuguese as our school, an international Portuguese. So thank you very much, Daniela, and uh, you have the word. Thank you very much, Marta, for very for the very um, for the kind introduction, for the invitation. Thank you very much, Ricardo Cavalho, as well, for the invitation. For me. Uh, I mean, I couldn't be happier in this moment to see so many familiar faces and also unknown faces, but uh, uh, this, uh, it's a good feeling and it uh, helps us to consider that uh, it makes sense to continue to study, to focus on what we are doing despite this uh, pandemic crisis. I will share with you my uh, screen, so the PowerPoint, I hope you can see, I will do now. Uh, full screen. Is it okay now? Perfect. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Lisa says so, uh, ha you have shared the screen. Yes. But yeah. you are. We yeah. are full. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Now. Now is it okay? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. For, then I start. So. Um, Yes, I think there are a lot, there's a lot to say. I'll try to make it a, a coherent narrative in one hour. And um, um, I also want to bring, make a bridge from the last session for those who are attending. I found a very interesting words. There was Ricardo who was mentioned that uh, he was fascinated by Barragan's buildings and he traveled to Mexico to see Barragan's uh, work specifically. And that's one of the reasons why I actually think that it's very, very important to uh, focus on actually the meaning of voyage in architecture. And that has been my, one of my points of departure, to consider what do we do when we travel after all. You know? So the title today is uh, Le Corbusier and Anthropophagy. And uh, I think I can have to press from here. Yes. So I begin with uh, some personal also experience. As undergraduate students at the School of Architecture of the Federal University in Rio de Janeiro, 
We learned about modern architecture and its protagonists not only through lectures on architecture history, but through daily experience above all. The building of our school was designed for teaching architecture through its space, gardens, and materials. The building, um, as some of our studio professors or visiting scholars were in fact very same actors presented in theory courses, such as João Figueiras Lima, Lele, Francisco Bologna, Sergio Rodrigues, Jorge U, and Severiano Mario Porto, who were visiting professors when I was a student. To mention here but a few. In our classrooms and studios, such as the one I show you now, meticulously designed by Georges Machado Moreira in the mid 50s, who worked with Le Corbusier during his stay in 1936, the ideas cultivated by the Swiss French architect were embraced with great intelligence and criticism. The spectacular views of the chain of hills along Guanabara Bay through the window panels of our studios were not only an invitation for contemplation, but also mostly a call for an awareness of the imposing nature. The challenge to designing such a complex city, whose landscape played a crucial role in people's everyday lives, was one of the first lessons we learned and practiced at this school. My first encounter with Le Corbusier before had less to do with the courses and books I followed and read, but more to do with the questions I was encouraged to ask, thanks to great professors I encountered. Uh, one of them, many, uh, some of them I made uh, here today, and uh, uh, one of them, Margaret Pereira, was uh, one of them. She invited me to challenge uh, why Le Corbusier and not Walter Gropius or Ludwig, Man Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, for example, produced strong echoes amid Brazilians, as well as why cities such as Rio de Janeiro strongly affected Le Corbusier. So I'll show you uh, some images of the school in which we learned architecture by being in this space. Today, my reflections insist on the importance of Le Corbusier's trip to the American continent in 1929. Choosing a trip as main object of this investigation was neither a simple nor accidental decision. As my research progressed, I came across materials that revealed a more complex understanding of Le Corbusier's vision of the American continent and the influential role played by artists, art collectors, writers, diplomats, businessmen, and politicians. An investigation of Le Corbusier's library confirmed his early interest during the 20s and in collecting and recollecting stories of the new continent. From 20th century travel chronicles to 16th century literature, such as the essays by Michel de Montaigne, we see here, yes, of which Le Corbusier had three different editions. And this is uh, in which Le Corbusier gives evidence of reading different moments of his life in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. So this one, sorry, this other edition. His handwriting, you see there are several moments present in the book. I became increasingly more aware of the relevance and I wouldn't say urgency of placing Le Corbusier's encounter with the new continent once again back on the current agenda of architectural historians. This is because the study allowed me to explore a considerable number of notions that are of critical relevance today, including modernity, D displacement, and here I understand in a broader sense, in more, in, let's say, in a French sense, déplacement or dislocamento in Portuguese, the transatlantic circulation of ideas and the European construction of the other. This is also a pertinent moment to argue for the relevance of a voyage being the main subject of a research undertaken at the school of schools of architecture. So. What are we doing when we travel after all? We are always verifying something, not Gilles Deleuze. What interests me more than this definition of voyage as presented in his Abbé 
was the fact that he drew attention to the name of Marcel Proust. And this turned out to be a fortunate coincidence when I was examining the books Le Corbusier possessed and read until the end of the 20s, being cause among these books was Proust à la recherche du temps perdu. So the veritable voyage, borrowing Proust's own words, were words familiar to Le Corbusier at that time. These have been key in considering the Le Corbusier South American trip, seem to have begun much before September 1929, the official date when Le Corbusier embarked on the ocean liner Massilia. Such geographical displacements appear to have been only a fragmented part of it. This has offered me the tools to build an approach centered on the voyage before the voyage. My argument then is that Le Corbusier had intended to confront and verify a number of assumptions once he had crossed Atlantic Ocean. I begin with the, yes, is it the, oh, sorry. I begin with words, Le Corbusier's words to architectural historian Siegfried Gideon. My dear Gideon, I just come back from the Americas. These are words that Le Corbusier wrote to Gideon in January 1930 on returning his long trip to Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay. The choice of using the term Amerique, Americas, and even the choice of naming the most vivid chapter of Precision, Prologue American, uh, Prologue American, seem to have. Uh, seem to offer vital clues about Le Corbusier's visions and plans for the American continent at that time. Moreover, by linking his South American lectures to an architectural commission in Oklahoma City, Le Corbusier imagined transforming this trip into a loop excursion over the American continent. His diaries of 1928 show the inclusion of New York and Oklahoma City in his plans for the trip of 1929. He apparently estimated, estimated that two weeks of traveling with stops would be sufficient to take him from Rio to New York, and then from New York to Oklahoma City. So here you see the, some of his notes. Uh, can you see it or you see the your your face is uh, I'm not so sure. No, we see perfectly well. Uh, wonderful. So he apparently estimated that two weeks of traveling would be enough. The interest in including the cities in the trip appeared after an invitation from the local businessmen to build houses and apartments for the State Athletic Club in Oklahoma region. If on one hand, it seems that cities of the North and South equally represented a new world of possibilities in Le Corbusier's eyes at that time, on the other hand, his precarious notion of the scale of this continent is also evident. Although he began to search for connecting lines between Rio de Janeiro and New York, his notes show that his unfamiliarity with the limited infrastructure concerning transport and the epic distance between the cities separated by almost 5,000 miles. In the beginning of the 20s, Le Corbusier focused on New York and a number of cities of North America when speaking of the New World such as in the book Urbanism. And this is, these are no news for, the, for a lot of Le Corbusier specialists who are here joining us today. And uh, we have some of them who actually had immensely focused and studied on the questions of the connection between Le Corbusier and the US. Mary McLeod is one of them. We have also Marges Bacon, we have John Lee Cohen and Francesco Passanti, and uh, just to mention, but a few. Between, so, but in this research, I argue and review that this narrative, his narrative, Le Corbusier's narrative, changed at the end of this decade, and his discourse on the Americas expanded. And this change became before the trip of 1929. Between 26 and 29, 
not only would his vision go far beyond the sphere of the United States, but it also proved to be very much influenced by individuals with whom he shared mutual admiration and affinity. One remarkable example, so I should, um, yes, one remarkable example is the strong contact he had with French historian Lucien Romier, revealed by um, uh, Mary McLeod, um, who, Luce Romier, was invited to attend the debates of Siam since the very first meeting in La Serra in 1928. So the letter with the invitation, he was part of the Redressement Francais and the member of the Comité de Patronage, mm -hmm. as he, Romier was part of whose critical discourse from Comier on a US society in the late 20s is in line with a number of Le Corbusier's writings, such as the book Maison en Palette, published in 1928. So some of the uh, books by Romier, and some of them are part of Le Corbusier's library. Sorry, these were books that I had access at the ETH, but some of them are part of Le Corbusier's uh, library. And the book in Maison en Palais, in which he also presents in a period he was very critical to the US society. So, yeah. The material investigated allow me to argue that while the Spanish speaking circle based in Paris was instrumental to Le Corbusier's visit in terms of making contact, the Brazilian circle in Paris went beyond the agents of those engaged in lectures and housing commissions overseas. Not only did they assist Le Corbusier during his stay in Brazil, but also mostly they contributed to Le Corbusier's view and expectation of the new continent. This is the cover of the book Maison Palais, for those who are not familiar with. It's one of the few books, I mean, one of a very important book that uh, is only available in French something that we have to do about it. We have to translate it in order to better understand this period. So instead of uh, viewing the exchange between Le Corbusier and a web of people connected with the Americas below the equator as a mere opportunistic situation for the architect to secure commissions outside Europe, I maintain that his encounters with businessmen, politicians, painters, writers, art collectors based in Paris were fundamental for the architect's preparations for the trip overseas. In the 20s, no other figure was more crucial to Le Corbusier's shift in focus regarding the American trip than the poet Blaise Sandra. I'm not the first one mentioning this, but I bother to look a bit further on uh, Blaise Sandra, who was a poet born also in La Chaux de Fonds uh, in the same year as Le Corbusier, and uh, who built a strong affinity and friendship for almost 40 years, 40, 40, 40 years with uh, the Arctic. So throughout the surviving letters written to Le Corbusier, here in this picture, you have Le Corbusier on your left, Fernand Leger, Yvonne, Le Corbusier's wife, and Les Sandras. Throughout the surviving letters written to Le Corbusier during the 20s, Sandra's words are filled with excitement about Brazil and the new possibilities that it could provide to both poet and architect. As already shown by uh, Brazilian scholars, not foreign, but mainly Brazilian scholars. We have um, Calil, we have also Margaret Pereira, we also have Carlos Mastins, who showed commas who were already showing this in the 80s and 90s, the text of Sandra, um, and these letters. So beside the correspondence, most of Sandra's books contained within Le Corbusier's files are embedded with stories of Brazil. Sandra's own experience in the tropics and many other experiences the poet had while traveling. These are what I have called Le Corbusier's Voyage Immobile to the Americas. And here is calling, uh, Sandra is uh, calling attention 
uh, the, uh, drawing attention to the fact that Brazilian uh, governors are about to build a new capital for the country, which is at that time named Planaltina. As you see it here in both uh, cards. So these are the books written by Sandra, the novels that are part of Le Corbusier's private library. In his narrative, Sandra did not speak of an exotic, primitive and wild Brazil, but of a plural, complex and urban land in a constant process of change. One novel that features in Le Corbusier's private library, Loch, unveils Sandra's sympathy with the dramatic story of the Swiss general Suter adventures undertaken in order to make a fortune in the new world. This 31 old man abandons wife and, not, and four kids cross the Alps, reach the harbor of Havre, navigates his way to the city of immigrants, New York, traverses, crosses deserts and rivers in a caravan heading towards far west California, builds a golden empire and finally found the settlement New Avetia, based on a true story, the novel but ultimately dies weak and bankrupt. So he dedicated this book uh, uh, to Jean Ré in engaging him to make Plan Altina. The book is from the mid 20s. Although this novel included descriptions of the United States, it was a time when Sandra was also discovering other Americans, most particularly Brazil and the impact of this income seems to have provoked echoes in the way uh, he apprehended the world. The Americas, in Sandra's words, were no longer a place of disappointment, but also expectation of expectation, achievement, and of action. The dream of making Plan Altina was not only evoked in Sandra's letters, but also in all the documents, such as the cover of the novel law, as you've seen it, offered by the poet to the architect. Sandra and painter Fernand Leger introduced another important protagonist to Le Corbusier, the São Paulo businessman Paulo Prado, who soon attracted Le Corbusier's attention, and the architect made their mutual interest in clear their first exchange of letters. In fact, the dream of making the future of capital of Brazil, Planatina, is running through my mind, Le Corbusier informed Paulo Prado. So a letter from uh, Corbusier to Paulo Prado, dated of 28th of uh, July in 1929. The issue of the construction of a new Brazilian capital, the theme that initially led Le Corbusier to write Prado, gradually lost its central place in the correspondence as time passed. Indeed, during dinners together in Paris, or visits to Le Corbusier's private houses in the outskirts of the French capital in 28 and 29. So here you can see uh, Le Corbusier's diaries. You see that uh, it's a fantastic material. You have uh, a lot of uh, uh, confusions but you slowly started to see that uh, you find Paulo Prado visits, visits with Paulo Prado and uh, also programs he's making the week. I hope you can see the follow the arrows. So what is going to do on Monday? Visits with the house together with Le with Leger, no? uh, the house uh, with the Madame Dato and this is a very, very interesting material and source. And I encourage for those who like to go further to study Le Corbusier to be more engaged with this type of uh, documents. No? Although it's not easy to follow, but you have on the right side this uh, weekly um, uh, schedule in which very carefully he mentions what he's going to do and also the address on your right, as on your left, as you see Prado, uh, on the Claridge, no, who was staying. So he has to telephone, call uh, Prado, who is in Hotel Claridge. No? And now again, meetings and having dinner with Prado. And here there are also the addresses of, uh, you know, um, colleagues and um, 
contexts of uh, in South America, such as Garaño, the two brothers, and uh, who were uh, in, based in Argentina, and Buenos Aires, but you also have, you see that he's putting also all the contexts together, and you have here, again, telephone, to telephonier Prado. No? Again, Romier, écrit Romier et téléphonier Prado. So another type of conversation began to take place and new arrangements were made, in particular surrounding the possibility of commissions in Sao Paulo. In this context, Sao Paulo was depicted unlike any other Brazilian city and presented to Le Corbusier not only as being a center of decision making, but also the place where economic power and modernity met. No? So he mentions here in Sao Paulo, we are very busy with questions of urbanism, no? and as he mentioned in a card to Le Corbusier. In Paris, the city of Sao Paulo was evoked in poems, such as the poem by Sandra himself, Sao Paulo, um, with drawings by Tarsila de Amaral, illustrations by Tarsila. It was also evoked in paintings, such as the painting by Tarsila de Amaral, and in books, Feuille de in which a poem, São Paulo, is part of the book. Although he was also presented in exhibit separately a few times in art galleries, such as Galerie Percier. The industrialization process of the city and its impact on urban forms and its multifaceted structure in which tradition, tradition and modernity meet some were some of the issues raised by Paulo Prado and other artists and intellectuals in contact with Le Corbusier, such as Tarsila do Amaral and Oswald de Andrade. Probably Tarsila is a bit more famous to uh, North American uh, colleagues, as we had a beautiful exhibition in the MoMA, a solo exhibition on the work of Tarsila do Amaral very recently. The connection with the Brazilians from Sao Paulo was also and above all rooted in the convergence of cultural interests and aesthetic sensibilities that were taking shape in Paris in the 20s. It was precisely within this constellation of ideas and debates that visions of Sao Paulo were conceived as the metropolitan capital of Brazil and the new basis for modernity. The representations of Sao Paulo, its urban landscape, hinterlands, folklore, and people were exhibited, published in periodicals. As we see here, a very uh, familiar periodical to Le Corbusier, Cahier d'Art, edited by Christian Zervos, one of his friends, and he's uh, often meeting him. Or, uh, so this is an example of the publications of uh, Le Corbusier's work in Cayeda. And in the same uh, uh, issues or in the same periodical, which was also included, uh, reviews about the exhibitions, exhibitions of Tarsila de Marau taking place in Paris, or even the Manifesto Anthropophagum uh, that the poet Oswald de Andrade was also promoting in Paris. Or even another very interesting uh, periodical, which is the Bulletin de l'Effort Moderne, uh, directed by Léonce Rosenberg, an art uh, uh, director of an art gallery, in which you are going to have also the work of Tarsila being uh, exhibited, likewise the work of uh, uh, Le Corbusier, Généré, and Aux Enfants, in different moments. So the connection with these Brazilians from Sao Paulo was also and above all rooted in convergence of cultural interests and in aesthetic sensibilities that were taking shape in Paris in the 20s. It was precisely within this constellation of ideas and debates that visions of Sao Paulo were conceived as the metropolitan capital of Brazil and the new basis for modernity. The representations of Sao Paulo now, as I already mentioned, were presented in these uh, periodicals and amply commented on during, din during dinner parties, therefore integrating consciously or not Le Corbusier's perceptions of the new continent before his transatlantic journey. Beyond the bounds of uh, pinpointing 
uh, equivalences in the texts of Paulo Prado, the writings of Paulo Prado, Oswald de Andrade, and Le Corbusier, what becomes for me uh, most relevant here is how this analysis has helped me to see the emergence of new understandings with respect to Le Corbusier's activity overseas in the late 20s. In this sense, Paulo Prado and Le Corbusier's attack on the academy, and most important, their defense on, of a revolution towards a new social, political, and aesthetic agenda, were not detached from their agenda for Brazil, each to a certain degree. It's tempting to consider Le Corbusier's determination to accept Paulo Prado's invitation to Brazil in terms of his favorable response to the Brazilians' revolutionary arguments for this country and vice versa. By choosing to respond to Le Corbusier's trip, Paulo Prado may have also found in Le Corbusier those characteristics that Brazilians saw in himself when defining a revolutionary. And I quote him, Paulo Prado, a constructor of a new order, an optimistic who still believes in making the present time a better one. Why I talk to you while I show you this very interesting painting by Tarsila de Maral, because it was exhibited in Paris. And uh, um, I'm convinced that Le Corbusier attended. It's a, a very bad sketch written in his diaries. And I think this is for you to also enter into this visual world in which Le Corbusier was being invited. And I show you, this is a later moment in which uh, it's a proposition uh, that, uh, uh, commissioned by Paulo Prado to make an extension of his house in Sao Paulo. No? So, 1928 was the year in which Paulo Prado began to cultivate a more regular exchange with Le Corbusier, having just concluded his most important study of Brazilian society. Portrait of Brazil, essay on Brazilian sadness. Both was both acclaimed and condemned by his peers and the national press and quickly gained popularity in the southern corner of the Americas and in France. Sandra, for example, was among the first to be willing to translate this work into French and to have it published in Paris. It didn't happen. The book depicts a bitter panorama of the Brazilian society and its history by using methods based on an analysis of the local political and cultural reality of the 20s and articulated with historical evidence found in written documents from the 16th century. With Retrato argued, well, Paulo Prado in his book argued that the case of Sao Paulo as the major capital city and powerhouse of Brazilian development. No. So Prado's challenge was to develop the thesis that Sao Paulo was an exceptional case in the history of Brazil due to its natural boundaries. These borders meant that the city had avoided being affected by the misfortunes of the capital at that time in Rio de Janeiro. It was a competition between the two cities and had preserved the superiority of the Paulista inhabitants, defined by Prados as mestizos. So, Sao Paulo in his eyes, Prado's eyes, functioned more than any other city as a mirror of all the achievements and progress and local inhabitants. However, rather than continuing with an analysis of Prado's thesis, what becomes critical here precisely is the fact that these ideas imply that Sao Paulo was the center of Brazil, that is the place where business as well as modern cultural events took place. And the fact that these same ideas would, in effect, be those incorporated by Le Corbusier. Sao Paulo was introduced to Le Corbusier not only as being the center of decision making, but also the place where economic power and modernity met. Le Corbusier's plan for the tropical Americas shifted in focus during the months in which he exchanged letters to Prado, with Prado. What at first seemed to be the only center of attention, the project for a new capital of Brazil, evolved into a more complex agenda with other interests added. Accordingly, Le Corbusier left Bordeaux in September 29 with a strong awareness of the driving role of São Paulo in steering the future of Brazil to the detriment of Rio de Janeiro. Such a conception, however, would not last long 
and there came an inflection point, a changing point, immediately after his physical experience of the country. Indeed, a wealth of sketches, notes, and plans leaves no doubt that the city that attracted Le Corbusier most during his stay in the Americas in 29 was Rio de Janeiro. Nevertheless, as we have seen before his arrival, São Paulo was largely the main reference and focus. So, let me see how much, uh, how am I going with the time? Yeah, Le Corbusier's close familiarity with the city of São Paulo uh, seems uh, to be important to be considered here, not only given this exchange with Prado, but also with artists to whom Le Corbusier was introduced in Paris. These were names that grounded a new artistic movement in Sao Paulo in 1928 by claiming themselves to be anthropophagos, as I show you the manifesto in front of you. Prado himself was a pioneer in supporting this movement. Moreover, he showed no hesitation in promoting such an, a notion among the Francophone friends. And he says, my country is anthropophagic and has already ingested many like you. Prado, Prado declared this into a letter to Blaise Sandra. Not yet popularized in the European sphere, uh, the term anthropophagy, which was just about to be re-performed by these Brazilians in May 28, was however quickly incorporated by Le Corbusier. I have not been eaten by the anthropophagus, but I witness the birth of a new world. These are the words written by Le Corbusier to his mom, to his mother in October 1928. The impressions he revealed to her, to his mother, of the new world were nothing but positive. People here, we start from zero and constructed stone after stone, he informed. Le Corbusier once described his impressions, not of Brazil, but of Moscow. The first new world he stepped foot, and the vocabulary he used revealed the extraordinary moment in which Le Corbusier was confronted with an awareness of the potential, potential and strength beyond European borders. All blind Europe who lies to herself to gratify her adults, he continues to his mom. Le Corbusier's use, the, use of the term anthropophage therefore is, is therefore, in my view, exemplary, exemplary evidence. It was deep rooted in the debates held by the Sao Paulo group and therefore not an arbitrary choice. Accordingly, these are interesting, in my view, indicators of Le Corbusier's space of enunciation within a wider and interconnected web of circulation of ideas. And they helped me to argue that the notion of the new world for Le Corbusier in 1928 was in fact much more broad and complex. It transcended the geography and its political dimension. It branded a relation between cities never before interrelated, Moscow, Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, Buenos Aires, and New York. It incorporated words and buildings constructed elsewhere. Once in Sao Paulo, so now in the trip, Le Corbusier encountered uh, the anthropophagia movement again, but it took place in a different status. It was no longer a safe territory for Le Corbusier, but in fact, the very land of the self-claimed cannibals, or anthropophage. Le Corbusier was not longer a mere spectator, but maybe uh, the European who was about to be eaten. I don't know. This is just um, a curiosity. But uh, it was above all an invitation to have another type of encounter with this new world people. Aside from holding two lectures at Sao Paulo, he had a very busy uh, uh, life with appointments in munis with municipal authorities and animated dinners with the Paulista Society. 
These exchanges were fundamental for Le Corbusier in his consideration of Sao Paulo and its modern representatives as an overseas arm of the Siam on American soil. As we know very well, there is a letter from Le Corbusier to Gideon presenting uh, Varsavisk. I'm sorry not showing you here, but it's a, with, a, um, with a cover letter from Varsavisk. And that was the first link uh, that it was um, made in order to bring a uh, CM chapter in Brazil, as already shown by many Brazilian scholars. But another type of experience often omitted has to do with uh, his Le Corbusier's pursuits uh, during his leisure time while visiting the city. And here, I invite you to make a comparison between Le Corbusier's sketch and those photographs made by Claude Lévi-Strauss a few years later. But they are impressive if we compare. Two experiences became important uh, arguments in introduction to Précision. His attendance at Josephine Baker's hall so these are sketches made during his leisure time and also attending um, Josephine Bake's music hall and his stay at Prado's State Farm in the north of Sao Paulo. I will show you in a few minutes. Through his correspondence with family, he confirmed having enjoyed Baker's revealing spectacle and in his diary. Le Corbusier even sketched and made notes of her performance on stage. Moreover, his notes include a proposal for a ballet, suggesting the background scene of the meandering sea of Santos at the end of a big ocean line. Baker's movements and dance are vividly described in the book Precision. In this book, the Corbusier link dance and move the crowds in, with the power of that African-American music had for being modern, honest, and ultimately human. The American singer became, through Le Corbusier's words, the archetype of the New World people, as already noted by Marge Bacon. In her extraordinary book on Le Corbusier and the Americas, but it's a connection with the US. Bacon's work is defined as both a symbol of modernity and a creation that speaks to the heart. Although Le Corbusier had certainly been aware of her music hall performance in Paris, it was on American soil that he watched her show and personally met her. Immediately after these words linking music, architecture, and the Americas, Le Corbusier moved into another type of essay on architecture in the New World, yet is still connected to the tropical forest experience. By doing this, Le Corbusier consciously played with two images embedded in the European discourse about the new world. He spoke to his French readers of the jazz music and the rainforest, therefore including in the book Precisions many more stories about Baker's uh, and Prado's property than the design proposes for the city itself. His narrations in the book are practically the same as those recorded in the sketchbook. Not only did he uh, keep using identical terms in his book uh, to those he employed while traveling, but also the same vivid tone and cadence was kept. And these I show image of the property, the state farm property, which Le Corbusier spent a few days, and is also with his cats on the left, and the Tarsiles cats above, and Tarsiles boogie boogie men uh, was also a part of, uh, let's say, uh, considered to be painted having in mind this property. Situated approximately 220 miles from the capital, Le Corbusier speculated on his experience inside the rainforest. His narrative is a mix of fantasy and reality. To make it more dramatic, he replicated images and folk tales. These are image, uh, this is an image of his sketchbook, particularly of those exotic crocodiles, big snakes, and other boogie men savage monsters that lived in the forest, which he learned about from Tarsila's paintings and Sandra's novels. Simultaneously, Le Corbusier ventured into philosophical terrain by declaring that one should have one's eyes and ears wide open 
and advising to his readers to judge everything as he find it. Despite this physical encounter with this tropical environment, in a vast coffee plantation, he was convinced that he was in the heart of Brazilian rainforest. Almost no word of the humidity, hot temperature, or typical mustiness can be found in his account. Instead, he spoke of the nuanced sounds of this place, particularly at night, and how blind and deaf European men like him could be once inside. The book in Precisions, he addressed the French reader using a rhetoric of the rainforest as a fascinated, impenetrable, and even menacing place, as Tim Benton very nicely explored in his research. Yet sublime too, since everything indeed is to be found in this American forest. I'm beside this hyperbolus, now that Benton and Cassim Boyer have correctly noted, Le Corbusier played with imagery of this new world. Moreover, he persuaded the reader to undertake a venture deep inside the forest and challenge to see where architecture is at. I could not resist to put together this uh, sketch drawings by Tarsila de Maral and those made by Le Corbusier afterwards. I think they tell a lot about this mutual interest and way. I don't want to find influence. I don't want to talk about who is getting what from whom, but to show you that there is a lot of sharing of world vision. So by being in this new world and in the land of the Anthropophagus, keeping his eyes and ears wide open and being ready to judge, Le Corbusier believed he had both physical and intellectual encounters with this American forest, secure, securing maybe a status equivalent to other you know, navigators such as uh, Christophe Columbus, uh, Hans Staden and Jean de Lery, and many other free spirits who discovered the new world and who considered themselves as having made a noble gesture by universalizing their experiences once back in the old continent. Such an awareness empowered Le Corbusier to incorporate his narrative and even cannibalize both corporeal and physical experiences. In this sense, he seems to assimilate the very flesh of the forest ancestors and the conquistadores all at once. For centuries, Europeans identified these lands as being the territory of the noble Anthropophagus. These New World people, of whom André Tavé, Jean de Rey, which I showed the drawing before, and later Montaigne he spoke as pertaining to a particular part of the continent, namely southeastern part of Brazil, in particular Rio de Janeiro region. They were associated with an added notion of society living in harmony with nature. Le Corbusier was well aware of this, and the experience up in Prado's farm, and in particularly in Rio, once he was there made possible a number of encounters and the encounters. Although Le Corbusier stayed only a few days in Rio de Janeiro, um, on the 7th of December, he took a day trip to the Guanabara Bay. So I show you the bay and visit the charming island Paqueta, which is a very small island. I was able to identify that Le Corbusier was accompanied by another painter, G. Cavalcanti, who also took uh, Le Corbusier to the quarters of the Morro da Favela and Morro do Mangue. So this uh, Paqueta was a place of uh, a retreat, retreat in those periods. And before going to Paqueta, he was also, of course, in a brodel with Diva County, where the two men sketched the women in a brodel. It is interesting to note how their drawings are simultaneously different, yet analogous, such that the eyes of the local and those of the foreigner are not so immediately distinguished when their paintings are placed alongside one another. On your left, you have Le Corbusier. On your right, you have the Cavalcante. It can be said that the island of Paqueta provided an exceptional double encounter. There, in 1929, not only Le Corbusier observed the simple quasi-rustic 
life of the fishermen and their attached roof constructions built in the midst of the greenness. But he also was able to savor spectacular views of Rio de Janeiro's topography and the scenery of Guanabara Bay Ahold, from this island and mostly from aboard the boat that provided unique angles of the city during the one hour trip towards the back of the bay, Le Corbusier's ideas for an urban project took shape and he presented this in a lecture in the same evening. While retracing Le Corbusier's steps in Rio, making the same boat trip a few years ago, I was able to reveal that the perspectives offered from the deck were fundamental to an understanding of Rio de Janeiro's topography, especially those features that could only be seen from inside the bay and on a boat heading to Paqueta. Even from an ocean liner entering the bay, the landscape profile of Rio is perceived very differently from Le Corbusier's depiction. So this is from the entrance of the bay. And this is a drawing from the back of the bay that he presented in the book. The first impressions to appear in the sketch before show the mountains of Rio from the ocean and are those made while aboard the cruise of Marsilia at the very beginning of his American tour. However, the project for Rio only appears in the very last page of his sketchbook, that is to say, during Le Corbusier's stay in town. In Précision, the book published after the trip, Le Corbusier, uh, Rio de Janeiro was claimed to be the place that epitoma epitomized the successful American experience, and therefore the city became the key argument in the essential perception of this trial. Le Corbusier holds up the notion of Rio de Janeiro and no longer São Paulo as the great mirror of the new world, just as several other Europeans have done before over the century. Not content with the triumph of being linked to the names of heroic navigators, explorers, and conquerors of the world, Le Corbusier proposed dramatic urban plans for the region, therefore endorsing Rio de Janeiro and its honorable, honorable people as the representative of a veritable, a veritable land of the new world. What I'm trying to say here is that as early as the first chapter of Decisions, Le Corbusier shall reveal his familiar Familiarity not only with the thesis of his Brazilian fellow Oswaldo de Andrade, the founder of the Atropophagia movement, and also of Prado, but also with a vocabulary deeply rooted with 16th century New World writing, such as the book Histoire d'un voyage fait en la terre de Brésil, autrement dit Amérique, by de Jean Lerry. An enthusiastic reader of travel literature, with a library that contains a diverse collection of travel chronicles about the New World. Le Corbusier, I'm convinced that Le Corbusier have well come across Jean Delery's book in the private library of Sandra in Paris, a man with whom he often dined and who he acknowledged as having pu pushed him forward with arguments, geography, maps, and photographs, while attempting to reproduce this spirit of adventure in the heart of the land of the Anthropophagus. By his corporeal presence, Le Corbusier plunged into the houses of earthbound people rooted in the region, and he re examined Delery, Montaigne, Rousseau, values of the natural and honorable man. These readings invited Le Corbusier to recognize New World people and landscapes as being central to the foundations of modernity. In fact, 19th century, in the, in the 1920s, a considerable amount of New World literature and iconography by Renaissance authors appeared in the editions in the Francophone world. These modernized versions shed light on the themes and concepts at the center of the intellectual debates taking place in the French capital at that time. The famous publishing house Flammarion and Payot re-edited, republished, in particular, two books on this entirely new order which was neither Turk nor African, but rather Native American, that is to say, the Tupinamba, a people who had been given significant literary form by two celebrated authors of the 16th century, Michel de Montaigne and Jean de Lery. Swiss writer and Renaissance specialist Charlie Clay 
introduced in 1927 the re-edition of Des Histoires by Jean de Léry. Addressing avant-garde circles, he suggested an analysis of important notions, beginning with the idea of the indigenous as les bons sauvages. He recognized a direct analogy, analogy between Rousseau, Rousseau's body of thoughts on the origins of the inequality in Delery's thesis of morality, Leclerc. For Clerc, this new edition was much more than a history of a voyage to the land of Brazil, because, because it insisted on the essence, essence of Delery's discourse, that is, a depiction of a primitive civilization whose social practices were ultimately more authentic and honorable than those of Europe. And I think it's extraordinary the comparison he makes, uh, not Clerc, but Jean de Lery, between the Guanabara Bay and the Geneva Lake. I still have uh, some minutes, and as you see here, the, the connection he makes, and Le Corbusier will do this connection, just like Sandra as well. It's interesting to note that Le Corbusier adopted the word anthropophagy instead of cannibal. For Delery, les cannibales were enemies of the French and uh, of the French and the Tupinamba tribes, whereas les anthropophages were our American friends. The Tupinamba were described as displaying noble gestures, noble human behaviors, and whose anthropophagy was above all a metaphorical ritual of revenge and an incorporation of conquered warriors' virtues, while others had a bestial and perverse taste. Far from being a mere question of choice of language, it's important the distinction for our argument that the Brazilian poet Oswald de Andrade and painter Tassila do Amaral adopting the term anthropophagy and not cannibalism, for example, instead of cannibalism, when calling for an aesthetic renew in Brazil. It is also no accident that Le Corbusier referred to this very term in his correspondence with his mother during his lecture in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, and in the introduction of his book, Precision. My effort here have been to review that among the clouds of words and meanings that were shared, the term anthropophagy becomes particularly interesting here because it allowed me to raise new questions concerning the links between Le Corbusier and the artistic circles in Paris and between Le Corbusier and Brazil. It became a revealing piece of evidence to argue that what had started as a joint presence in social circles in which there was an incorporation of common ideas and practices of modernity a few years later developed into a selective and elective affinity cemented by a shared world vision and common or mutually influential interests related to an aesthetic sensibility as well as a political cultural agenda If we are not to forget that for centuries, Europeans identified this Rio de Janeiro lands as being the territory of the noble anthropophagos, and that Le Corbusier was well aware of this, the experience up in the favela opened up a number of encounters and re-encounters for him. The favelas and its good-hearted people, boring Le Corbusier's words, did not reveal an utopian state of nature to the architect, nor did they make him aware of a perfect society of the new world. Nonetheless, the experience brought him back to these humanists and led him to judge what in the present nature of man is original and what is artificial. I show you images from the period of the favela and on the lower part you have picture uh, photographs taken by Le Corbusier himself, but in 1936. In his writings, so I'm almost finishing, his writings about a new architecture developed in the 20s. Le Corbusier did not neglect the contradictions within the ordinary and apparently rudimentary way of building on the doorstep of the machine age. These contradictions were inherited to the thesis he was about to defend in his books and lectures of the period. While embracing knowledge of engineering and ferro-concrete, he placed 
the main accent on the people, the mountain dwellers, the Alps, and the fishermen of Paqueta, in order to adopt a point of departure and argue for what he deemed architecture really deserved to be. So these are words he also used himself in uh, his book Precision. Accordingly, so here you have uh, his photographs taken in Paqueta Island in 36, a drawing uh, of the Akasho, and on your left, Dika Volcanti's painting of Paqueta. Accordingly, a common misunderstanding implies the immediate identification of primitive with underdevelopment. For Le Corbusier, however, primitive was not at all associated with undeveloped activities. Furthermore, it carried a meaning that transcended geographies and folkloric phenomena. Secondly, primitive was not related to regionalism, in my view. L'Arche Decorative d'Aujourd'hui, a book published in 25, is a useful example for proving that Le Corbusier strongly criticized the idea of regional arts. For him, they no longer challenge the problems of the present time. This was directly opposed to a discourse which claimed for a national style. Primitive for Le Corbusier does appear to properly acknowledge the challenge of a modern architecture, since for him the term offered what scholar Adolf Max Vogt called a double meaning, that is to say an archaeological as well as an anthropological. And that's why I put in, in parallel Claude Lévi-Strauss and Le Corbusier. Therefore, it embraced an appreciation for the history of ancient histories and other cultures. Not only Max Vogt, but also Passanti provides interesting relevance to us through his arguments on Le Corbusier's allusion to Rousseau's theories of primeval beginnings, in which the institutions and their practice were strongly criticized, doing the architects' own struggles and the academy. So it's a bit more complicated. This interest in the favela, this interest in the rudimentary, it has been immensely discussed by several uh, of us here, but I thought it was interesting for us to be addressed. For Le Corbusier, the ordinary practice of men offered foundational principles and source for challenging canons that contemporary society had established, but which no longer correspond to a modern reality such as the rolly built residence executed by the favela inhabitants, the Bokreki uh, houses erected by the Turkish farmers, and the huts made by the farmers of the Alps. Despite this apparently paradoxical and even romanticized attitude, Le Corbusier's way of representing the world not only recognized, but also worked within a crisis of sensibility provoked by technological revolutions. So how a voyage can deeply affect an architect and why these intellectual displacements marked a shift in Le Corbusier's architectural and written production were the main challenge and axis of interest at the start of this talk today. To conclude by proposing numerous encounters between Le Corbusier and the New Americas encountered in the 20s and also in the early 30s, I have argued that Le Corbusier's first transatlantic voyage did not begin when he stepped foot on American soil in 29. I began to speak of encounters as voyages of discovery and rediscovery because they incited Le Corbusier to confront cities, landscapes, and local people on the one hand, and to change his discourse on architecture on the other hand. In his discourse, Le Corbusier traveled through Rousseau's theories of the primitive and Delery and de Montaigne's concepts of the anthropophagus and the honorable cannibal, while emphasizing his own experience in the, house, in the houses of Morro da Favela as a sort of an attack of the European fake way of living. He embraced Oswald de Andrade's stories of the Pais da Cobra Gange, the land of the big snakes, Sandra's fantasies of the Inuit de la Forêt, one night in the forest, as himself made these whole notes in his sketchbooks. It's part of, uh, one can make a knowledge of the Sandra's poems. 
Inu dans la forêt. While narrating his own judgments in everything during his encounter with the rainforest, his description and celebration of the everyday Rio de Janeiro were embedded with memories of Arcachon in France. And finally, his enthusiasm in proclaiming the urban architecture design for Rio de Janeiro and Guanabara Bay echoed his encounters with Lake Geneva and the Alps, which I shall speak of geographies, we encountered geographies. But this is a theme for another talk. By insisting on the construction of new narrative concerning Le Corbusier and the voyage to the new continent, I have attempted to intersect historical periods and enlarge the way we have been discussing Le Corbusier and writing about modern architectural history. Incorporating new names, books, and sites for building more complex histories and narratives in our field of architecture. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Daniela. Um, I would say that, um, what, well, in fact, this lecture bears witness once again to Le Corbusier's inexhaustible legacy but also the usefulness of research on his work and thought, a subject about which it seemed that everything had already been said when paradoxically we can understand that there is still almost everything left to say. Um, I hope that you can uh, put your questions here in the messenger, inscribe your questions. We have already a question from, or a commentary from Patricia Hecht-Tauer. I don't know if, Patricia, you can switch on your microphone and your camera, please. Hello. Hello. Olá. Então, estamos aqui no sul do Brasil. E uh, muito obrigada pela, pela palestra linda. Uh, acho que toca a nós, brasileiros, nesse momento tão é um trágico, inclusive, político que a gente está vivendo e hum, é importante a reflexão. Obrigada, viu? Hum. Muito bom. A pleasure. <laughs> yes, it is. It is hard to avoid making it, you know, bringing to our current uh, realities uh, that we've been facing right now in Brazil, politically speaking. But uh, I think uh, if we try to be already critical to dominant narratives, <laughs> it's already a, a, a great effort, no? And uh, yes, so thank you for your words. You have a question, I don't know, <laughs> I'm sorry to cut you. E desculpe te responder em inglês, aí eu integro as pessoas, mas você pode perguntar em português. Não, tá? desculpa eu perguntar ah. em português. Uhum. A língua é o inglês mesmo, porque é. tem assistentes de todo mundo, né? É. Mas uh, não tem tanta fluência assim para falar. Talvez francês. Não tem problema. There's no problem. We help uh, to translate your question and I answer in English. Se você quiser, oh, eu... eu... Yeah. Well, I don't know, you, we have lots of comments here um, that, uh, and we also have uh, uh, some comments that say that uh, it's a wonderful lecture. Thank you, Daniela, for sharing it with us. Everybody is very happy with the the lecture and uh, also for the images, for the, the iconographic part of the lecture, which is quite rich and shows lots of documents that are not accessible to, to others, right? Then there are some, uh, comment, uh, some comment that has been made by Caroline Beatriz Piccolo. I don't know if you can switch on your microphone and uh, camera, Caroline. Well, she's trying, but uh, <laughs> she says that uh, she's trying. But well, 
I could uh, make you some kind of a commentary or a question while uh, Caroline is trying to switch on her uh, microphone and camera. Um, well, because in fact, uh, Le Corbusier was really uh, one of the first really global architects, right? And somehow it reflects a little bit uh, also the, um, his influence and actually it reflects a little bit the interest that, that he had uh, gained uh, all over the world. That's not, uh, of course, that it's um, uh, the, the fact that this audience is so uh, global uh, today on this lecture, I think that it's, uh, uh, it's Daniel Ortiz's fault, but it is also uh, Le Corbusier's fault. Absolutely. In fact, totally uh, global and international. And uh, well, it's very interesting because in fact, you can more or less define an architect through his uh, trips, the trips that he has uh, made, because in fact, we can understand that Khan would, could only be Khan having traveled to Egypt, for example, or we can understand that Bernard Rudowski could only be Rudowski having traveled through places never traveled before. Um, and how do you think that these uh, travels really influenced uh, Le Corbusier during his, uh, well, his career as an architect and a thinker? Uh, well, it's absolutely a very pertinent question, uh, but I can also open uh, the, you know, this debate to other scholars who are around because uh, it deals with a much broader issue than it goes beyond the trip to the Americas, right? But uh, if I may say a few words, I think it's very interesting. First of all, especially now, when we are considering uh, in the architectural curriculum, in the architectural education, travel is still considered a very important, uh, let's say, almost institutionalized practice in order to conduct your studies and to be trained as an architect. No? But I think it's quite interesting to when you consider saying, so what is the meaning of architecture? Or what, what's the meaning of traveling for us nowadays? You know? And uh, I had a very interesting experience at ETH in the School of Institutionalized. Each semester, students need to uh, participate, uh, uh, attend uh, trip excursions organized not only by chairs of architectural theory or architectural history, but also studios. You know? So the idea of traveling is much more expanded, but although it is encouraged, it's part of the curriculum, it's part of the education, the training. And um, so the question is how much we are invited to see or to verify what we um, uh, or to confirm certain things in which we are culturally trained to do it so. And I think it is, and how much we are aware of these practices, of being invited to see things in order to go there and look the way you want to. So I think this is, these are quite, quite interesting. When we start to, uh, let's say, go a little bit beyond the narratives and beyond what Le Corbusier himself presented, it's much more deeper. It's much uh, more complicated. And the, so there are two things that uh, for, were useful for me. I must say, first of all, I, was, uh, I had the pleasure to attend Tim Benton's uh, course in Lausanne, Epifel Lausanne, uh, in the 2011, maybe, was it Tim Benton? <laughs> well, and then uh, it was an invitation to, to read Le, Le Corbusier's uh, uh, books that Le Corbusier preserved in his private library. No? And uh, so it was, uh, for me, that's when I, let's say, uh, I invite, uh, he invited myself to go to see Sandra's book. No? I had already suspicions, we already had suspicions that it was important to read Sandra, but when you read Sandra, you see, well, okay, Le Corbusier is traveling intellectually through Sandra's books. I don't wanna make like very simplified narrative. Ah, uh, because he read this book, he got this, no? <laughs> but it is very interesting to see how you can travel through books. And Le Corbusier was also doing so, not only to the question of the tri his trip to Brazil, to South America, but also many other trips as he has been shown 
Liverpool by Gresleri and by uh, um, also Gravagnolo and, and Passandi and several other scholars who were studying all the trips and all the journeys you know, that were considered, let's say, as part of a Grand Tour moment. This uh, trip to South America it's, it's, a, it's also very complicated because it's a mix of many things. No? So why Le Corbusier for us, and I try to be uh, clear in the beginning of the lecture, uh, yes, it, he is an important architect, but there are two things. Being a Brazilian, I was invited to ask myself why, I missed, why, we are, why Le Corbusier was so interested in Brazil and why we are so interested in his work. So it's not a natural process. No? And I think this is also another thing, that it's an invitation to also travel through Le Corbusier's uh, work. I don't know if I answer, but I try to make it a bit more complicated, the situation, no? So travel as an, an, um, an intellectual travel, a travel to confront, to be confronted, to, to understand the other, but at the same time to think about yourself, no? And I'm trying to go away from Le Corbusier and consider how we are traveling nowadays. And this was very helpful. Through, Le Corbusier, through the studies on Le Corbusier's trip, I was invited to consider how we can travel differently. I mean, intellectually and also confronted with other things. Yeah. It's a broader view on traveling that probably we can take some profit right now when we can't really travel. We can still travel uh, intellectually. It's a good advice for us now uh, at this moment that we are living on. That's the only yes. thing. That's no other way now. That's no other way. Yes, there's no other way. Uh, Mary McLeod has a commentary. I don't know if you can make it uh, yourself, Mary. Can you switch on your sound? And uh... No. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. Perfectly. Well, first, I was thrilled by the lecture. It's a wonderful lecture, Daniela. And I, what I really appreciated was how you got beyond what I hear too much in the US, a kind of knee jerk um, rhetoric of otherness that puts everything in a kind of colonial or post colonial or orientalist perspective. And I think you gave it a complexity. Um, and nuance uh, that I very much appreciate. Um, I mentioned an article I thought of when I was listening to you on The Primitive, I don't know if you know it, by Adrian Forte, where he reverses a lot of art historian rhetoric on The Primitive as somehow um, orientalist or uh, colonialist, degradating, um, and says that it often has a positive value um, and he tr tr relates it back to the word origin and beginning. Um, I'm not sure that works totally for Corbusier, but I think it brings another perspective. Um, a really reductive question I had was, what do you think of um, his obsession with bays and mountains? Um, he talks about Rio as the most beautiful city, and then he gets to Algiers, and he says almost the exact same thing. And whether it's an echo of Lake Geneva or Lake Le Mans, or whether it's just a particular landscape that he's obsessed with, I wonder if you had thought about um, that. Well, very good question. Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you very much. For me, it's really a pleasure, you know, to have this conversation with uh, uh, with all of you. For it's really, it's really a pleasure because it helps me to think further. But I must say that my uh, experience has been almost ten years. I've been living in Switzerland, in the German-speaking part of Switzerland, which is already another world <laughs> uh, to uh, to the Geneva part and so on. But the first time I've been in the Lac Le Mans and the areas, the vineyards, you know, where near the house of Corso, La Ville Le Lac, I felt like, um, well, there is something going on here that is, it rings me the bell. It rings me the bell. It's a uh, uh, Le Corbusier, um, he, we connected a lot with the French culture. But we have to remind him that he's a Swiss man. He was born in Switzerland. I think Swiss scholars have uh, tried to 
very much to, to state that, to make this very evident and clear. Uh, I think there is an article by Vomos in a, in, a, in a contribution of the Atlas of Modernity. It's a beautiful connection in which he uh, makes a visual link with Ferdinand Hodler's iconography of the Alps, of the lakes. So uh, this whole cultural, not only a physical encounter, I mean, his father was part of a member of the Swiss Club Alpin, <laughs> the Schweizer Alpine Club. I, I think I pronounced correctly uh, Swiss Alpine Club, I would say it. So it's not something that it, it, you encountered like uh, later on. It was part of his uh, cultural life, although he was coming from La chaux de -Fonds, but in the very much a connection with uh, this region of the, the Lausanne and between Lausanne and Geneva. And, uh, and I think you were right, he was obsessed because you cannot just simply uh, ignore the mountains. Uh, like in Brazil, like in Rio, you cannot ignore. Even if you want to, they are there. It took us like uh, Margaret, you knows very well as a Rio de Janeiro specialist in the history. It took us like centuries to be away of the center because simply we had rocks, no? We had, uh, it's part of, of uh, uh, it's a reality. So it's not only a geographical determinist, it's not this, but how we culturally connect it. And so that's why I am working now on a project that I come and, and call it Reencountered Geographies. And that's why uh, I link the idea that how Le Corbusier will had such a sympathy and affinity to see and to, to have an interest in the landscapes of Rio de Janeiro, it's because he was already prepared to appreciate and to, to understand how to, to do it. And the, the project for Geneva, I think it's also a first, uh, let's say, uh, big effort. Not only Geneva starts already in the Ville Lac for the parents, but in Geneva, he makes this as a manifesto. No? And I think you were right. He's going to use this and see this in the in as well. No, and uh, we can discuss the question of the Mediterranean. So the question, I think, of the landscape. No, it's very, it's very imposing nature, and it's going to be a, a, a question for Le Corbusier. He will be often coming back to these topics. You know, and that when he makes the connection between uh, the Geneva Lake and uh, Guanabara Bay is in the book Sur les Quatre Routes. There he makes the connection. It's not in the precision, although the sketch and things already tells a lot about it. But I don't know if I answer, but I think there is indeed an obsession, but it has to do with this, also with this very much uh, youth uh, cultural, uh, let's say, experience with this mm -hmm. nature. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much, Mary. Mary McLeod from Columbia University and uh, uh, for your participation. Now I will pass the word to Margarita Silva Pereira, one of the first researchers, uh, well, the first to have uh, tried to make this approach on what concerns to the relationship that Le Corbusier established with Brazil already in the 80s. I think that your book was from the 80s, right, Margaret? <laughs> Long time ago. <laughs> Uh, can you switch your microphone on, please, so that we can hear you? Oh. Perfect. Bon dia. Excuse me. Yes, it's an old, old book, 30 years ago. I apologize because my English is not so good, and maybe I prefer to speak in French. Uh, but... Um, at first, in English still, I would like to, to thank you both, Marta Sequeira and Dani Ortiz, because you had a very, a very particular and excellent uh, moment of reflections, of uh, uh, questions, uh, uh, enlarging our views about architecture and uh, the architecture of 20th century then thank you so much to, bo to both you both for the invitation oh, thank you, <laughs> i hope to i hope to be here also in other in others um, in others uh, meetings um, 
Ah, eh, je, je vais poser la question en français. Peut-être que c'est plus facile pour moi. Eh, Dani, merci. C'était très... C'est formidable pour moi qui a vu la naissance de ta thèse et qui a accompagné ta thèse de doctorat à, à l'ETERA, de voir comment aussi, un, 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 toujours un présent, un présent, les Corbusier et, et ses relations, les Corbusier, sa manière de penser l'architecture. Tu, maintenant, je vois une Daniela Ortiz beaucoup plus mature encore et, et, et c'est merveilleux quand on vieillit de voir <rire> justement comment, co comment ça se passe dans la vie intellectuelle de chacun d'entre nous, c'est très beau merci beaucoup et juste pour provoquer un peu la discussion et comme au moment où je suis rentrée, on parlait des Bahagan hein, et tout de suite après, euh, tu as évoqué la question d'une imposing euh, euh, en imposante nature, euh, je, je voudrais savoir si dans l'état actuel de tes recherches et dans cette excavation euh, de l'idée d'Amérique euh, chez les Corbusier, hein, si toi tu as pu croiser davantage euh, un défi énorme pour les études post-coloniaux, pour les études décoloniaux, comme on dit maintenant, ou comme simplement moi je préfère, d'autres épistémologies, d'autres formes de penser la science et les savoirs et les connaissances. Et si tu as pu déjà donc, faire cette excavation archéologique autour de, du voyage, de l'idée même d'Amérique. Parce que ça, c'est une question que depuis 1983 ou 1985, quand Jean-Louis Cohen a fait les colloques avec Hubert Damisch à Paris, c'est une question qui me taquine, parce que pour nos chercheurs et, et, et qui font des études sur l'histoire de l'architecture dans nos Amériques, et dans nos Amériques latines, d'une manière générale, c'est un problème très grand, une sorte de kidnapping de, de l'idée d'Amérique associée aux États-Unis. Et j'ai dit ça parce qu'on parlait de Bahagan. Et dans ces voyages du, du mot « Amérique », qui sort d'un territoire assez particulier où Américo Vespucci est resté plusieurs mois à la dérive et qui va de Cabo Frio à Ilha Grande, donc va dans cette région de Rio de Janeiro, qui sont sortis les lettres apocryphes, mais attribuées à lui encore en 1907 par là, 1907. 1507, et, et, et ce sont ces lettres-là qui ont fait fortune. Et comme euh, toi-même a montré, encore au 16e siècle, seconde moitié du 16e siècle, l'Amérique était le territoire parcouru par Américo Vespucci. Donc, si on fait des excavations successives, bien sûr, il y a un sublime technologique américain du Nord, et un sublime technologique qui nous traverse à tous, même cet homme primitif qu'il va chercher dans ses moyens technologiques. Mais je pense que pour nous tous, d'autres parties du continent américain et même du Canada, je pense qu'on a intérêt de creuser certains thèmes américains d'Amérique Vespucci et comment il est approprié dans les différentes parties de, de notre continent par cette aspect. Parce que je, et, donc, et comme tu n'as pas parlé les mots d'Américo Vespo, ce que j'adore, donc je, je te provoque pour savoir. Les mots bon, sont, sont dans la thèse. Les Américo Vespo's words sont dans la thèse. Oui, mais pas aujourd'hui. But not today. You are right. You are right. You are right. So if I if I if I may answer, I mean it's a very very provocative. It will require a lot of uh, discussions. But uh, if you can, um, what I would like to say is, for example, indeed, uh, a Margaret, if you can put, se pode botar o o mudo que está fazendo eco. If I may say, for example, thank you. If I may say, um, I'm. Uh, it is. It was, we saw it together. You helped me when we were in Gideon's files at the Getty archives. We were doing this research together on Gideon's files. We found this letter of Le Corbusier and that you told me, you helped me, said, 
Daniela, look at this. Entrée d'Amérique. What is the meaning of that? What is the meaning of that? And then I, it was an invitation, and or actually provocation, or almost like <laughs> imposition, to say we have to stop talking about uh, Amérique Latine or uh, South, South America for Le Corbusier, because for Le Corbusier, in this period, there is an ambivalent position. And he's going to use the word Amérique when he wants to address this particular part of the continent. You know? There might be several other reasons. You know, promotion, concept, there is a lot, to, including uh, uh, more geopolitically speaking, uh, let's say, debates. And that's why in the thesis I, I, I explored quite a lot his exchange with Lucien Comier. Comier, there is a geopolitical debate between who is ga uh, gaining you know, their rivals, France or l'Amérique, l'Amérique du Nord. You know? And th there is, a, 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 in the, so there are two levels. There is, in the, in the French-speaking Parisian milieu, there is a question of uh, uh, questioning this new North American uh, um, society, you know. It's a fascination, as it was very well discussed in the book, in the conference, in the book organized by Cohen and Berdamiche in the 80s, in which we had the participation of uh, MacLeod and Tim Benton and many others here. But I think it was, it, it is this, it is a moment in which there is an ambivalent position because there is a French uh, speaking milieu trying to position themselves globally speaking and also making their also own uh, other alliances, reconnecting certain uh, alliances. And you have another level, which is this whole interest in, in the avant-garde debates, like if we call avant-garde debates, if we could call like this, in the intellectual debates in the Parisian milieu, of re-editing this new savage order, re-adding 16th century books. So my connection is not that Le went to see 16th century books, and he might have done so, but it was in the 19th century, these books became in re-edition in French, several of them. The Tupinamba, it's going to be, the Autrement dit Amérique, it's going to be, it's going to be part of this moment in which there is an interest on the, this order, no? This totally new order, so the question of the order is the question. And uh, so the, the, it is an ambivalent position, but I would, uh, in my thesis, I insisted indeed that in the 20s, there is a shift in the meaning of Americas for Le Corbusier, and he's going to address Americas as the southern part. The 30s and the 40s, then is a different thing. For the books he published, he'll talk, you know, the book, uh, uh, Villeradiz, the other books from the 30s, there's another position. In the 20s, in the milieu in which he's involved, the artistic milieu, the intellectual milieu, and the political milieu, there is uh, an understanding of the Americas that is different that we understand now. If we say Americas now, we connect to the US, no? but in this period, it was not a common ground. And he is part of this, uh, of this moment. No? We have to be very uh, careful. And I, I think it helps for the historiography of Le Corbusier. It helps to understand the conditions of possibility of scholars who are trying to make the connections in different moments. So I don't want to condemn uh, books like Marge Bacon's that wanted to bring the idea of Le Corbusier in the Americas uh, connecting only to the US. It was a condition of possibility, it was a great contribution, but nowadays we can already understand that it's much more complicated, right? And in the 20s at least, there is an ambivalent position and he's addressing Amérique, Americas as this experience of this under, uh, above the under the equators, no? So it is, it is very interesting because of Sandra, because of our, of course, of Sandra, of his connections that he had and the affinities, no? So this awareness of words, terms, as placed as, as terms who are inventions, cultural inventions, attributions placed in space and time, this is a very important uh, topic for us.
it will make no sense to talk about Le Corbusier in America Latina. Latin American is an invented term, an external term. No? You might use this afterwards. It's going to take place. But I, just to um, not uh, extend so much, but I think it's a very, very important topic. We should organize a colloquium only to discuss that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And to, to, I don't know, Mary McLeod or uh, Margaret also mentioned, I don't know for those Kobu specialists, I don't want to close the debates, but these were questions coming from. There was a meeting of the Rencontre de la Fondation Le Corbusier recently in Paris, and it was Le Corbusier and the so-called primitive arts. In my view, it was, uh, uh, we, we could have done better, these debates. We really could have done much better because it's much more complicated. No? And uh, why we are not talking about, for example, it, it took place in the ethnographic museum, right? Why we they haven't discussed the exchange between Claude de Vistos and Corbusier, for example. You see the, the, the image, it's amazing, you know? So it's not that there is a, a mutual influence, but there is an interest on the ethnographic approach. So there is a question of the oddness, there is a question of, uh, of trying to understand yourself through the oddness. There is an aesthetic sense, but there, is a, there are a lot of other questions involved, you know? We deserve to talk about that, you know? So, and also including the idea of the, of the Amérique in this period, this oddness, this favela people, <laughs> no? how he ignored completely that these uh, favela people are living in completely miserable situation, but still he was one of the few who bothered to look at them, <laughs> no? because it is still a minority. No? It was a minority and it still is. No? Yeah. I stop. <laughs> Sorry, Marta. <laughs> Uh, Thank you I'd very like much. To, I would like to, to make a question. Uh, May I? Yes, Tim. Oh, sorry. Okay, João, João Rodaya no, from no, the please, university. Tim, uh, No, I can do it. It's more a comment. I want to thank you very much for your conference. I enjoyed it a lot. And um, just a, a little comment. You know that Le Corbusier was in Portugal for one single time, uh, in exactly on the trip on the Massilia Absolutely. to Brazil. So he stopped in Lisbon, and we know that he left the boat. And so he walked through the city, through the city. He went to a bullfight, as far as we know, and we have several drawings of uh, himself at the coastline entering the bay to Lisbon. And in a way, uh, I think that, um, although in a modest way, that his trip, uh, that is this small stay of one or two days in Lisbon, was also one of the keys for him to look at Rio. Because in a way, um, when in 1936 he says that, or even in the, in the Precision, he says that Rio is a Portuguese city, in a way, uh, Comparing with Sao Paulo, which is not, in a way, I, I think it says it says it. He says it because he knows he knew Lisbon before, and so he knows how to compare both situations. But also, I think it's interesting because you know Lisbon is built on hills. It's a hilly city, and almost all the colonial Portuguese cities copy Lisbon. So the Portuguese cho have chosen small special places with that kind of topography, including Rio, or Salvador, or whatever, you know? Or even in Africa, it's the same thing, even in the first one, in Funchal, in the Madeira. So in a way, I think perhaps uh, Lisbon was also one of the keys for him to understand how Rio was in terms of an uh, urban situation. Um, so it, it was just a comment for you. Perhaps you, one day you would like to research this kind of uh, possibility. Not only, thank you very much. A reaction back, quick one. I agree with you. And not only his physical experience was important, but Sandra himself, yeah, when well, he writes the book uh, Fait de Route, he makes a series of uh, uh, texts, image, uh, very iconographic yeah. texts. Sorry, text. sorry to interrupt you, but you know that Sandra, Sandra was in Lisbon several hey. times. Exactly. He also wrote for Portuguese magazines, the, yes. the Futurist 
yes. Portuguese magazine. So yes. there was is a connection with Sandra too. Yes, exactly, exactly. And I have no doubt that this uh, conversation with Sandra and the way also Sandra is presenting his uh, you know, narratives, because they are very uh, visual narratives in the books of Faye de Route, it's also part of, uh, of, uh, of this uh, uh, experience Le Corbusier will have and travel he will have. No, I think it, you are right. And, uh, and we have to study more of this and also through other sources. So it's to go beyond the, let's say, the disciplinary field of architecture in order to return and come back and discuss it again. <laughs> yeah, you, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Joao, for your participation. And uh, Margaret also, it is an honor to have you all here. Uh, Tim Benton, do you, uh, you would like to make any comment or yeah. ask a question can, can to Daniela? You, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly well. Okay, good. No, no, thank you, Daniela, for a wonderful, wonderful lecture. And I encourage everybody to read your thesis, which is a mine of information and a full of stimulating ideas. I, I want to make um, a, a comment, um, a large one and a little one. Uh, the large one is really about the context for the search for the, the origins. Uh, Mary mentioned the word origin. And this, you have to remember, this was a major theme of the 19th century, even uh, obviously from Rousseau onwards, from the 18th century from Rousseau onwards. Uh, but uh, all the way through the 19th century, people are trying to find uh, a way of um, getting behind the terrible effects of industrialization and so forth and searching for primitive myths of Nordic myths or vernacular architecture, as Francesca has talked about. The, uh, open air museums and all these things, all of which the Cabrizi was very interested in. The Cabrizi was very interested in, in open air museums, for example. So there's such a, a origins. Uh, long before he went to um, South America, uh, he was talking about the savage. And he was talking about the savage in terms of fishermen in the Bassin d'Arcachon. So I think this period of his summers spent in the Bassin d'Arcachon from 1926 until 36. Uh, is extremely important because it, it was here that he articulates for himself and in the book in Maison en Palais, which is extremely important, as, as you rightly said, and needs to be translated into every language, um, that he, he begins to put together the various different elements of this. Rousseau on the one hand, Adolf Loos on the other, Loos who said that architects have no culture, only the peasant has culture and so forth. Uh, his um, observations of, of uh, his trip to Spain in 1928, when he observed the uh, innocence and perfection of the countryside of the peasants in the country compared to the cities where industrialization had produced kitsch and so forth. And so he's describing, he, he talks about the, the honest people, if you like, for the Bassin d'Arcachon as savages because he is searching for their, for their wisdom. And I think, uh, you know, you, you rightly quoted, you know, this thing about um, verifying travel is verifying something that we, we bring with us. And this is what I think he was bringing with us. He, he already had this idea that uh, it wasn't the jungle, it wasn't the anthropocentric so much, it was the people of, of uh, Argentina, and he discovered that, he was very disappointed of course with Buenos Aires, but the, 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 the people of, of this new world would somehow lack all the sophistication which had ruined, ruined the West. And he finally found it, in Brazil um, and to an extent in, in, in South America. The smaller point is uh, just um, part of the origin of the connections that you very well spelt out uh, preparatory to going to uh, South America, Lucien Romier, for example. Lucien Romier and Ernest Mercier of the Redressement Francais were among the very important people who uh, were brought in to defend uh, Le Corbusier's League of Nations project. Uh, by Christian Zerbos in Calle d'Ara. And these were his kind of new friends on the far right, <laughs> or mostly on the far right, as Mary has, has, has described, um, who this new face of industrialization, not um, the, the power mongers, if you like, of industrialization. And that I think also was part of the baggage that he brought with him when he went to uh, South America, was searching again for an authority, uh, a, a power, um, which would enable him to do great things at La Nautina or uh, whatever, or in 1936, the University of, of um, Brazil or the uh, Ministry of uh, Public Health. Yeah, 
I, I, it's a comment, but I think I agree with you. It's it's a bit more complicated. It's not simply just a, a trip, a grand tour trip. That's it. Mm. It's a, a overlaying. Uh, uh, there are layers of complexity that uh, it's related to this trip, you know. And I try to make sense. Uh, uh, so the thesis is all about what happened before the trip and some verification to not reproduce what actually happened in the trip. But the biggest part. Of the, of the thesis has to do with this very different, let's say, complexities that deals with the conditions of possibilities of Le Corbusier in the 20s, right? And you are right. I think the book uh, uh, Maison en Palais, for those who cannot read uh, French, and but if you consider the quantity of people who still study Le Corbusier, and if they cannot read this book, it's so difficult to understand this period because he's already addressing all this, uh, let's say, questions no? that has to do with a seduction uh, with authorities, with a necessity. It has to do with questions of tourism. It has to do with the questions of the origins. It has to do with the meaning of this new architecture. Where are the, let's say, the fundamental elements in order to build it? So it's a, it's a several, uh, it's a very, very complex. I don't want to uh, uh, consider that this, uh, the, uh, I don't want to bring an exhaustive uh, you know, argument. It is just another narrative what I try to bring as a complement to this complexity. But I agree, it's a, it's a period in which we have to be very careful in order to avoid um, reductions and very simplistic uh, uh, interpretations. No? And things are, are should be put into, into context. The drawings, so simply analyzing the drawings are not enough now the drawings have to be coming with uh, with other sources that are not only available in the files, like of these files, there are plenty there, but there are also other archival um, uh, institutions that help us to to trace and track certain uh, trace certain tracks. But I yes, no, I I definitely agree. I wanted just to comment, I think Jose Barqui was making a note on the landscape. Barqui, I don't know if we have time to comment back on the, on the question of the landscape. I'm sorry, but, uh, but yeah, there are so much uh, to discuss <laughs> here. Well, yes, there is also a question from, from Mario Magalhães that is, uh, thank you very much, Tim Benton from the Open University. And then there's Mario Magalhães from the university, well, that is with us from Rio de Janeiro. Mario, can you switch on your microphone to make the last question? Because we have lots of questions here, but <laughs> we can't. Probably we should manage to arrange some kind of other conference, bigger one, <laughs> to be able to make the full discussion. Mario. Okay, so thank both Daniela and the uh, Universidade Autónoma de Lisboa for this opportunity. Now, take the opportunity also to react to Tim Benton's uh, idea of a search for the origin or the original. And I think that um, both Prado and Le Corbusier were reading Nietzsche. So, all at the same time when they were reading, okay, uh, Rousseau and so on, and they knew this uh, much uh, older literature. But I think, in a way, when they what they find or re-encounter in, in this primitive or this otherness, it's not so much a, a static origin in terms of a, a static figure, but rather a crisis sensibility, as Margaretti usually says, a crisis sensibility in, in this particularly particular moment when they were reimagining their own uh, societies. So, uh, in a way, I think this this openness to the other and to a critical standing in regarding to the other and oneself is much seems to be what brings together both the Brazilians and Le Corbusier at this point in time. So it's it's more of a comment than <laughs> uh, a question. But it came to my mind when we, we, you, Daniela mentioned our trips nowadays and uh, architects nowadays and why they travel. And many times they travel just to reproduce uh, spectacular, spectacular images 
and not actually to uh, be in a state of judgment about themselves and the world. Fantastic comment. I think that Tim wants I, to I have a little tiny react. Comment, because yes. I, I do want to support what Mary said about the use of the, the word other, which obviously is very important, the, you know, the other, the exotic, the different, and so forth. But the, the, the whole point of the search of origins, as far as the Cabrizio was concerned, was not searching for something outside himself, he was in himself. He wanted to, to find his source of pure creativity himself. And that, that, that's also Rousseau's point of view, and so forth. And, and Lewis's as well. It's, it's how to get rid of the civilization that is distorting uh, art and architecture um, through education and through all you know mechanization and all these things and it's this distrust of civilization uh, he's trying to strip away so it's not the it's not the fascination with the exotic other it's it's trying to strip away what civilization has uh, brought you know brought about all about us sorry it's not, but you cannot escape from the fact that uh, you come from this uh, own civilization and society that contributed <laughs> to destroy, <laughs> you know, and that's what it makes very complicated because at the same time that you want to ignore, that's the, the, the whole crisis <laughs> that you try to avoid others, but you're part of, of it. So you have to infiltrate yourself again and you cannot. Uh, uh, look at the others with other instruments than your own instruments. No, that's that, that's and these these are the the, the complexities and the uh, and the and the line is very blurred, very nuanced between how much we want to uh, make a favor by helping others, <laughs> no? but uh, at the same time imposing it. So I give just a, again an example that for me was a really amazing discovery. I found in an auction. No? on the website of an auction, the drawings by Di Cavalcanti of the women in the Brodel. No, I couldn't find anywhere else. I still use this print screen image of the auction. And if you put these two ladies together, no, this is the same lady, it's the Perla Negra, no, the object, objectify uh, black body, the women of the Brodel, and so on. If you put them together, it will say, well, you know, We've been celebrating Di Cavalcanti. I love his work. It's a very wonderful Brazilian modern artist. But you celebrate the Brazilian modern arts and you contain at the same time the French conquistador, the one that are imposing the colonialist and so on. And it, what is this type of discourse? We have to put things a bit more into context because if you put them together, who is actually conquering who? You know, I mean, both are objectifi objectifying women. But because one was part of a specific uh, national discourse of celebration of modern Brazilian modern art, the other one was attacked. I mean, I'm talking about the, let's say, how scholarship uh, interpreted and used it in a more complex way. So indeed, I think it's, it's a dilemma. It's a quandary, you know, and, I, and it, we have to go further. But these efforts of putting things into context and trying to understand um, and try to avoid label, labeling people, but try to understand them in the conditions of possibilities. I think it's a great effort already, you know, to, but you are, I agree, it's just a comment to your comment. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you very much, Daniela, for this fantastic lecture. And thank you all for this uh, 